DiscerningHearts.com presents The Trinitarian Reality of Self-Giving Love, a Discerning Hearts nine-day online retreat with Monsignor John Essif and Sister Cora Immaculatum Heffernan. Monsignor John Essif is a priest of the Diocese of Scranton, Pennsylvania. He is a founding member of the Pope Leo XIII Institute, which specializes in the training of priests in the areas of exorcism, healing, and deliverance ministries. He also served as a retreat director and confessor to St. Teresa of Calcutta. He continues to serve as a retreat leader and spiritual director to bishops, priests, religious, seminarians, and other religious leaders around the world. In many instances, he conducts those retreats with Sister Cor Immaculatum Heffernan, who is a member of the Sister Servants of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. She holds several degrees from Marywood, Notre Dame, and Syracuse universities. She is an accomplished artist and musician, as well as a counselor and spiritual director. During the course of nine episodes, both Monsignor Esif and Sister Cor offer a sequentially guided online retreat that will break open the theme entitled, We Are Called to Live the Trinitarian Reality of Self-Giving Love. Participants are encouraged to have a Bible and journal ready for notes and reflection. They are also encouraged to take significant portions during the day or night to spend time in prayer to contemplate what they have heard and to listen to what God may desire to communicate to them during this grace-filled period of retreat. We now present Monsignor John Essif and Sister Cora Immaculatum Heffernan. Today we're going to introduce in a, in a special way, not God the Father or the Son, which is an amazing Savior that we have, but God, the Holy Spirit. And we are going to receive him through the sacrament of confirmation. Now, I really feel that in my own life, as a, as a Catholic, uh, there are three persons in the Blessed Trinity. There is the Father. I was baptized in the name of the Father. And the Son and there's the Holy Spirit. I was baptized into three persons and one God. And this was extremely important for our God. God is a trinity. But I didn't realize the, the extent to which the Holy Spirit was equally God. I really felt that as a Catholic growing up in my parish, at my time, in my school, in my family, enough wasn't really made of the Holy Spirit. And when I received the sacrament of confirmation, I was told that the Holy Spirit was going to come to us. And we had to study very hard our catechism, and we had to go through this catechism. But I noticed, and even in prayer, that even in the divine praises, when we went to benediction of the Blessed Sacrament, they didn't have the Holy Spirit. And this was just really amazing. And as far as when, you know, my, my a relationship of what intimacy what I had, I learned the Our Father right away. And I certainly knew about Jesus. But in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. He was like the left and right shoulder. And when the bishop was going to come for confirmation, we had these red bows and girls had those and we had our red ties and the, the power and was that supposed to be the, the tongues of fire that came from the Holy Spirit but they were just red. And we, we really didn't see the connection there at all with the fire of the Holy Spirit. And, and with regard to the power of the Holy Spirit. And so I, I, I'm, I'm really thinking, so I think it's very important that Sister read to you the teaching of the church on the sacrament of confirmation. In the Catholic Catechism, number 1296, 
It states, it is God who establishes us with you in Christ and has commanded us to put his seal on us, given in his spirit, in our hearts, as a guarantee. This seal of the Holy Spirit marks our total belonging to Christ, our enrollment in his service forever, as well as the promise of divine protection in the great eschatological trial. There's a seal put on us. We are signed with the Holy Spirit. When we received the Holy Spirit, and especially we received him in baptism, we, because we were baptized in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. When we receive the Holy Spirit in confirmation, the Holy Spirit came upon us, and we were to have seen that we were sealed, sealed in the Holy Spirit. Uh, like when, when you stamp, we, we were stamped with the Holy Spirit. Well, I, I really don't know if I really got the awareness that God was to be seen through us and that we were witnesses of God and the Holy Spirit and, and the power that came through us. And so when we received confirmation, and, and I was about uh, 10 when that happened, and Bishop O'Reilly came to our parish, we sang his hymn that I would really think it's kind of important to invoke him now in our gathering. Come Holy Ghost, create for blessed, and in our hearts take up thy rest. Come with thy grace and heavenly aid to fill the hearts which thou hast made to fill the hearts which thou hast made. O Comforter, to thee we cry, thou heavenly gift from God most high, thou font of life and fire of love, the sweet anointing from above the sweet anointing from above praise be to thee father and son and holy spirit three in one and may the sun on us bestow all gifts that from the spirit flow all gifts that from the Spirit flow. Well, the church needing renewal and the Holy Spirit being the Holy Spirit is going to fire up the church, to stir up the embers. And he certainly did that with Vatican II. And the Protestants were invited, the Orthodox were invited, Jewish came people, listening and there were so many observers at the at the Vatican II Council and they were kind of mixed and there was a lot of a lot of mixing and as John the 23rd said and Paul the sixth open up the windows a joinamento and this mustiness that, that we want to renew the church and revive it in this newness and when the Catholics began to read the scriptures more. And this has happened with Vatican II. And then they began to have more prayer meetings. I remember this charismatic movement occurred and I was, I had just come back from South America and I was quite ill. And I, I was, I don't know if you remember this sister Court, but I'm sure you do. I'm so sick and I could hardly 
get around. And during those days, I was at home with my mother and father recuperating. And I got a call from Misericordia. It was a local college. Now, the charismatic movement had gone especially to Duquesne, to Notre Dame, and to college campuses. That was the first place. And so many people were all stirred up and with the, with the charisms of, in the church, that each of us who is baptized has these various spiritual gifts that we have. And so when I uh, came to, uh, to celebrate the Mass at Misericordia, and I said to my mother, would you like to come with me, Mom? And my mother said, well, she had her rosary. She had her little office of the Blessed Mother. She had her scriptures. She had all kinds. If it was going to be a prayer meeting, my mother was ready for it. My mother was a great prayer. And so we went, and I came up to the to Misericordia, and I, I remember being there that day. And they had a temporary altar set up. And so what I began to do was I began to, here I was uh, before this altar, and I said something like, let us pray. And with that, the place erupted in prayer. And it was singing and carrying on and music. And it, well, I wasn't saying, it was, in, it was just really beautiful sounding, and then it quieted down. But every time I'd say, let us pray, those people pray. And they, they, it was him, and I didn't know exactly what it was, because I couldn't understand what prayers were being offered. And, and, and at the end of Mass, so at, as I was going home after the Mass, I, I said to my mother, I thought she surely be confused by it. She said to her mom, how did you like that prayer meeting? Well, my mother said to me, you know, that was so wonderful. She said, do you know the man next to me? Did you know him? Because the place was jammed with people. And, and it was just shoulder to shoulder in that, in that room where I was having the mass. And this was at this charismatic meeting. And she said, he didn't look Lebanese. She said, but do you know what he did? She said, he sang the Gloria of the Mass. And it was in Aramaic. Aramaic is not Arabic. It's an ancient language. And it's, it's really rarely used in, in the world today. And there are some places in Iraq that they still speak Aramaic, which is what the language of Jesus. And my mother, because she knew this, sang it with him. And the, it, was, it was so beautiful. So when they talk about the gift of tongues, when they talk about singing in languages, I always say yes. You know, and, I, and I've had an experience of that. You see, Praising God all over the world in various languages. This is like the renewal, is, is the power of the Holy Spirit glorifying God, praising God, honoring God, adoring God. And this certainly whipped the, the whole people of God in, and so. This renewal began, and sister, I would like you, if you could, to please read to us the gifts that come with. Now, this renewal of the sacrament of confirmation, this renewal of the power, this is what we're really leading up to in, in this time in Pentecost, because it's with the coming of the Holy Spirit that at Pentecost, we're going to celebrate the conclusion of this retreat. You know, it's really beautiful to realize and even to go back into the Old Testament to the prophet 
uh, Isaiah, in chapter 11 uh, of Isaiah, uh, this, the fruits and the gifts of the Holy Spirit are so beautifully, beautifully spelled out. But a shoot shall sprout from the stump of Jesse, and from its roots a bud shall blossom. Now this is the part. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, a spirit of wisdom and of understanding, a spirit of counsel and of strength, a spirit of knowledge and of fear of the Lord, and his delight shall be the fear of the Lord. Not by appearance shall he judge, nor by hearsay shall he decide, but he shall judge the poor with justice and decide fairly for the lands afflicted. He shall strike the ruthless with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked. In that prophecy by Isaiah, we have the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. And the church has uh, said that when we receive the sacrament of confirmation, we receive those gifts. Uh, wisdom, there are seven of them, wisdom, understanding, counsel, fortitude, knowledge, piety, and fear of the Lord. And each of them, if we were just to take and, and describe each one, um, wisdom is really seeing from God's point of view. Wisdom is really truth. And we receive that in a special way in the sacrament of confirmation. We have received these seven gifts in seed form in the sacrament of baptism, but in confirmation, we receive them much more fully. Understanding is another one. Grasping in a, in a limited way the truth of our Catholic faith. Uh, and so uh, it's limited, but uh, we are receiving that. Uh, counsel is the next one, and that's so important. We might say that counsel is like um, prudence, but prudence is, could be a natural virtue. Uh, counsel is a supernatural virtue, uh, and it's giving us right judgment uh, to know what to say, how to say it, when to say it, what to do, how to do it, when to do it. If we uh, say something, if we have to correct a brother, let's say, or a sister, if we say it, uh, how do we say it? Uh, do we say it with love and uh, understanding? Or do we say it roughly and accuse in, in an accusing way? What to say? So we ask the Holy Spirit, give me the gift of counsel so I will know what to say, let me know how to say it, and let me know when, because if I say it too soon and they're not ready to receive it, it will not bear fruit. So it's really a supernatural gift uh, of a right judgment of prudence. And the next, of course, is courage. And that is a, a fearlessness, uh, not being afraid to stand up for the truth. Uh, not be able, no matter what people will say, uh, stand up for God and his, his truths. Do not be afraid of uh, the, the judgment of your peers or what it will look like or sound like. Um, be able to stand up for good over evil. And that's, that's another gift. Then uh, knowledge. And knowledge is a... a, a is different from wisdom because wisdom is that seeing things from God's point of view. But knowledge is really seeing what it is that God wants me to do with my life and how to serve him and uh, its action. We're acting on that wisdom that we get. Then piety. So often when we think of piety, we think of folded hands and you know being so perfect well, none of this is perfect. Piety is really under, uh, 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 what we could call understanding the virtue of religion. Uh, really realizing that uh, it's, it goes beyond our sense 
of duty, that we are doing something and wanting to do God's will, wanting to serve his people. Uh, and so that piety is, is a, a much more uh, intentional kind of desire uh, to serve God, to love God, to spread his word, worshiping a God and serving. Uh, then fear of the Lord. And you know, sometimes when we think of fear, uh, it's sort of a cringing kind of thing that be careful, God's looking at what you're doing. And that's, that's not what this beautiful gift of fear of the Lord is. Fear of the Lord is an awe, just uh, standing in awe at this marvelous God, the creator of all things, who has made all things and given them to us and uh, for our use. And he is the creator. And then knowing that we are the creatures of ourselves, we are nothing. And so having that right uh, look at the truth of, of God, the awesomeness of God, and the littleness of the creature of who we are. And so those are the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit that have been given to us in, in greater amounts uh, in confirmation. We receive them in seed form in baptism, but they come to us much more fully in confirmation. And as, as Monsignor said, confirmation was given uh, when we were about. 10, 11, 12 years old, when physically and psychically and emotionally, we were beginning to grow into youth and then into adulthood. And it was so beautiful. Okay. When Sister said that quotation from Isaiah, it was that very text that Jesus, when he stood up in the synagogue and asked for the text, and he unrolled it. He read that from Isaiah. And then he said, this very day, this prophecy has been fulfilled in your presence. I am God's son, is what Jesus was telling us. And I have come to establish the relationship. That's really what piety is. That piety is the right relationship with the Father. And the brokenness that has happened throughout all mankind. Now here I am, God's son. And I, and I will have this relationship with my Abba, with my Father. And I am going to incorporate each of you into me. You see, when we receive confirmation, he comes into each of us. We have been sealed. We have been confirmed. And the charismatic union, the charismatic renewal brought about so many beautiful things in the church. But I really believe a lot of confusion, I think, came and as, we, as we kind of saw this, this freedom that came after Vatican II, we began to lose the central reality, the central point of the Trinitarian life being that which exists in each of us, in each member of the body. And that relationship that each of us has is with the Father the primary one that we have as children of God and confirmed members of God, we are gathered into one body. And it began to recognize that we are a broken body externally. And God prayed, Jesus prayed at the Last Supper that they all may one as thou fought in me and in thee. And I was tremendously aware of how much needs to yet be done when 
in if I saw it as a child of ten years old, and how how really we had been covered over with rubble as far as the message of the Holy Spirit was concerned, and if I saw a glimmer of the renewal in in Vatican II and in the aftermath of it with the charismatic renewal. In 1985, I found myself in Beirut. In uh, 1983, I had a, a bishop in Scranton, and his name was John O'Connor. And he went on to become the Archbishop Cardinal of New York. And, and when he was there, there was a certain place in Beirut that was under his charge in New York, in the Archdiocese of New York. And there was a group that wanted me to come and interview for that, for that work. And it was kind of secret and so on. And I was going to be sent there as a Vatican and I had a Vatican passport. And so it was right in the middle of the war and I found myself in Beirut as the head of the Pontifical Mission for Palestine. And there it had been founded by a little known Monsignor, Monsignor Montini, who later became Paul VI. And he established these, these places in, in, in Lebanon that were the place for the pontifical, for the mission refugees that came and there were, uh, they were Palestinians that came into Lebanon and they were settled in 14 different camps. It was my job to take care of those camps. And that's what the office was in Beirut. And it was my territory was the whole Middle East. But the raging war that had taken place in there for years was something I knew little about. But I was not quite educated as far as what was going on in that huge war between the, the, the Jews and the Palestinians and the Syrians. And it was, it was just like a, Beirut was like a, a place of violence and explosion. And one day I was going to be flying to Cairo. I was going to be going to Egypt. And by this time, I had been there about a year, and my, my driver refused to take me, although I had a Vatican car. And usually the Vatican's, the Vatican car was very much respected in, in the war zone. But I had to take a Middle East airline bus. And I got on the bus and I was going to be going to the airport, which was in West Beirut. And the Middle East airline bus left East Beirut and was crossing the, the line, the, the green line, and went into West Beirut. And we were on the airport road leading to the airport. And we were surrounded by a group of Iranians. And they all had around their necks keys that was given to them by Athala Khomeini. And they all had machine guns. And they stopped the bus. And they got on the bus and they started to beat up the driver and screaming, La ilaha Allah, ilaha Allah. There is no God but God. And then they put the guns on the people in the bus. And they said, which of you are Christians? And they had intentions of shooting us. Well, I stood up along because I had my cassock on. I always wore my cassock in the Middle East. And so as I stood up with my cassock on, which is my clerical dress. Then the others, there were about 18 of us men stood up, mostly men. 
and we had our hands behind our back, professing our faith in Jesus. And they were beating up the bus driver. They hit him in the mouth and his teeth flew. I, I, the violence there. And he was beating him up and screaming at us. And which of you are Christians? Yen, they began then to curse this trinity that we're talking about today and yesterday and want to talk about for the glory of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And they said, you have destroyed the unity of God and you are heretics and you deserve to die. And when they were screaming and yelling, none of the men, they all had, I had, I never carried a gun and I never, I just refused to. But as I, as I was there, I was seeing just this violence around me. And I, I saw the men, some, some, some of them kind of inching toward or maybe even thinking about, but no one ever exchanged gunfire. And finally, after beating up the bus driver and screaming at us, they got off the bus. And there was a lady there and, and she came over and she always reminded me of Veronica as she bathed this man's face, who was all bloody and he fainted. And one of the men got up into the driver's seat. But here's what I was, I had never, this is the scene that I saw. I looked at their eyes and I saw fire. They didn't care. They were handsome young men between about 18 and about 24, 25, and they didn't care. They were going to either kill or be killed for, the, for Allah. And they gave their lives and they were here and they had this key that would have taken them to paradise. They fire. Where is the fire? I know that the apostles came down and I could see fire in a Paul. I can see fire in Peter. I can see fire in the apostles. I can see fire in Stephen. Divine illumination and life radiating through each of them. The early church was on fire. You see, what was it that happened on Pentecost? Tongues of fire came down. You know, when I thought back at my, my confirmation and, and Bishop O'Reilly said, you're never gonna have to die for your faith. That's not true. That is not true. We have a life in this world at this time when many, many people are dying for their faith. When I saw and lived in Beirut, you know, all of the priests, you know, was a very dear friend of mine, a Jesuit, Nicholas Cruthers, was, he gave his life. He came from Holland and he was, he was a beautiful young, man of 42, 43. And I, I always asked the Jesuits to, to see that maybe he could be canonized. He, 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 he had, he had the, a, a magnificent life of a priest shod with the gospel of peace. He had five parishes in the Baycott Valley. And he used to go from one to the other. And in the middle of war, he was a man of peace. He opened up schools 
for children. He opened up medical clinics for people so that they didn't have to have their babies in Beirut, but could have them in the Beka. And he just was a man. And one day, he, one of his seminarians got killed. It was at Christmas. But he just continued on. And during Holy Week, he had intended to be Jesus. Indeed he was. During Holy Week, he disappeared. And I was called to identify him. And I went out and I saw him and his body. He had pulled out his teeth. They had pulled out his fingernails. They had electric shock. He was naked. His groin. And they put a tourniquet around him and threw him in that well. I thought, what was he thinking? What was he thinking? I just saw Jesus in Father Clifford's. You see, when you meet men who are martyrs for the faith, I, I saw them, and I saw them over and over again in Beirut. God has called us to witness. You see, that is what it means. Martyrdom doesn't necessarily mean shedding your blood. Martyrdom means witnessing. And each and each and every one of us, we carry Jesus. And it's the fire of the Holy Spirit that has come upon us that transforms us into him. And then he, through his suffering and dying, brings about salvation and he rises from the dead. Nicholas Kruthers is alive. And all of those martyrs are alive. And all those witnesses. And it's the fire that gives them that transformation. You see, you were baptized by water and the Holy Spirit. That came upon you. We talked about that yesterday. You were confirmed and sealed with the Holy Spirit. Sister is going to tell you now what you are to, to think about and what are your gifts? And how do you see yourself as a member of this body? The sacrament of confirmation is a sacrament of witness. Down through the centuries, the witness, as Father said, the witness of the apostles, the witness that's going on even today, but throughout the centuries, all the martyrs who did it by giving their lives. And we are asked to witness. But we're also asked, through the graces that we receive at confirmation, to minister, we have actual grace, which enables us to choose good and avoid evil in our own lives. But beyond that, to be helpful, are uh, you know just um, searching for ways to serve God, and so. Um, in, the, in the whole area of ministry, there are so many ways we can do it. Uh, you, we can minister through teaching, through preaching. It's a way of ministering. Uh, definitely by living our lives as, as witnessing the good that we are and the good that we do. Um, there's another way we can minister, through healing. How many times 
have you been called to help people perhaps who are mourning the death of someone and uh, there that death and dying that whole process there and you have to minister to them and to their families uh, you, you uh, minister through the healing of memories some people are are so caught into uh, unforgiveness because of memories that they have so healing and there are many ways of healing we'll be talking about this in a few days but the ministering to people that way teaching administration is a, uh, a ministry and some of you are called to administer uh, there are ministries of uh, the liturgical ministries in in the way we we celebrate uh, and, and in the way we uh, the read the gospels preach the gospels uh, we have eucharistic ministers uh, there are are many ways and there are also very prophetic ministries uh, when you think of people who are really uh, really taking as as a, a ministry for themselves uh, really exposing the horrible way that immigrants are uh, treated and and certain groups of society are treated um, they're, they're, they see what has to be done what is not right and they are proclaiming it what are we doing to the environment they can be prophetic in what is seen our scientists many times are prophets as well as scientists and do we listen to them but these are gifts of the Holy Spirit but there are other gifts also music is a gift uh, celibacy is a gift uh, art the arts are gifts um, you have by location some of the great Saints uh, by located uh, we have miracles uh, and they are the outward signs of something that is going on inside uh, so we all have different gifts maybe you're a good cook maybe you farm well maybe you're uh, great at numbers uh, I think one of the things that, that we'd like you to do after having heard um, fathers talk about the power of the sacrament of confirmation and the witness that we can be and the gifts that we have received why not go and spend some time this evening and this afternoon uh, thinking of the times that God in some way touched you throughout your life when did you feel the touch of God? Uh, when did he gift you with some knowledge or some experience that was so helpful to you for your growth and your, your holiness? Uh, go back over your life and try to see what is the predominant gift that God has given you. Is it the gift of listening? Is it the gift of being a peacemaker? Uh, whatever your gifts are, is it your gift of being able to love others? Your gift of being able to uh, do the works of mercy, the beautiful works of mercy, visiting the sick, the imprisoned, taking care of the homeless, uh, being able to uh, give of your own wealth being able to tithe so ministry in the church can be carried out uh, what gift has god very specially uh, showered upon you and then in your own families where if you look at your husband what gifts did god give him that that sometimes we just don't bring to mind or we take for granted what gifts has he given your teenage children 
your little children, your youth that is now at college or at work or has left home, what are their gifts? What positive things can you see and thank God for? Because they have been gifted and being gifted this way and using the, all of those gifts in service of others, they are proclaiming to the world that they are Christians. They are doing what Jesus in the gospel taught them how, what to do. And they're doing it with the grace that they're receiving and the gifts that they have received from the Holy Spirit. There's a very beautiful passages, sister, that perhaps beside doing these, uh, they can also, could you, uh, especially 1 Corinthians. Yes, 1 Corinthians 12, uh, from 12 to the end, which is like 26 or 27, is so beautiful. that they, There's the unity of the body, but there are so many gifts. And the body is one. And, uh, you know, uh, sharing those, those particular gifts. Um, for example, uh, well, let's just take part of it. Uh, if you go from, from um, 1 Corinthians 13, uh, 12, as a body is, is one, though it has many parts, and all the parts of the body are one body, so also Christ, because we're all baptized into one body. It's not a single part, but many. If the foot should say, behold, I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body, it does not for this reason belong any less to the body. Or if an ear should say, I don't belong to the body, it's not for this reason belong any less to the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God placed the parts, each of them, in the body as he intended. If they were all one part, where would the body be? But as it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I do not need you. Nor again, the head to the feet, I do not need you. Indeed, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are all the more necessary. And these parts of the body that we consider less honorable, we surround with greater honor. And our less pre presentable parts are treated with greater propriety. Whereas our more presentable parts do not need this. But God has so constructed the body as to give greater honor to a part that's without it. So there may be no division in the body, but that the parts may have the same concern for one another. If one part suffers, all parts suffer with it. If one part is honored, all parts are honored. Now you're all Christ's body and individually parts of it. Some people God has designated in the church to be first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then mighty deeds, gifts of healing, gifts of assistance, administration, varieties of tongues, <clears throat> are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, do all do mighty deeds, do all have gifts of hearing, do all speak in tongues, do all interpret, strive eagerly for the greatest spiritual gifts. And those spiritual gifts are really the gifts that are all contained in the faith, in hope, and most of all, in charity, in love. When you uh, pray this evening, this afternoon and evening, why don't you pray chapter 13, verses 4 to 13? But instead of saying, love is patient, love is kind, put your own name in. You know, Mary... You know, I am patient, I am kind, I'm not jealous, I'm not pompous, I'm not inflated, I'm not rude. I don't seek 
my own self-interests. I'm not quick-tempered. I don't brood over injury. I don't rejoice over wrongdoing, but rejoice with the truth. I bear all things and believe all things and hope all things and endure all things. And then the next part is love never fails. If there are prophecies, they'll be brought to nothing. If tongues, they will cease. If knowledge, it will be brought to nothing. For we know partially and we prophesy partially. But when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I thought as a child. I used to talk as a child, reason as a child. And when I became a man, I put aside childish things. At present, we see indistinctly as in a mirror, but then we will see face to face. I shall know fully as I am fully known. So faith, hope, and love remain but the greatest of these is love spirit of the living god fall afresh on me spirit of the living god fall afresh on me melt me mold me Fill me, use me, Spirit of the Living God, fall afresh on me. God bless. You've been participating in The Trinitarian Reality of Self-Giving Love, a Discerning Hearts nine-day online retreat with Monsignor John Essif and Sister Cora Maculatum Heffernan. To hear and or to download an audio presentation of this retreat, visit discerninghearts.com or you can hear it on the various Discerning Hearts streaming platforms. To view other sessions in this particular retreat, visit the Discerning Hearts YouTube channel or you can find it on discerninghearts.com. This has been a production of Discerning Hearts. We hope that if this has been helpful for you, that you will first pray for our mission. And if you feel us worthy, please consider a charitable donation, which is fully tax deductible to help support our mission and to be able to continue to offer specialty programs such as the program you just experienced. But most of all, we hope that you will tell a friend about discerninghearts.com and join us again. God bless.